All right, welcome to the Logs on Horn Frogs. Uh, TCU beat Oklahoma on Saturday, which is a thing that hasn't happened since 2014. They were 1 and 11, I believe, going into this game since joining the Big 12 Conference. Um, I said before uh, the show, or I said on the show Friday, I was like, hey, I think it would just be good if they stayed, you know, competitive with OU. And I was very wrong. So, uh, first of all, Matt, like, let's just, let's just start here. Oklahoma lost Lincoln Riley um, at the end of last season. He went to USC and they hired Brett Venables. And, you know, like when Lincoln Riley left, there were a lot of Oklahoma fans who started saying things like, well, you know, we could never get over the hump of Lincoln because his teams are always soft. They weren't physical enough. He wasn't a defensive guy. They didn't play defense. And so now we got Brett Venables and we're going to be tough and we're going to be hard nosed and we're going to be physical. They gave up 668 yards on Saturday, <laughs> almost 700 yards. They gave up 55 points. If TC would have tried, if they would have put their foot on the gas pedal, they would have scored more points against the Oklahoma Sooners than they did against the Tarleton Texans. They scored 59 <laughs> on Tarleton. They scored 55 on OU. They scored 41 in the first half. Gunnar Henderson, who looks like the professor from the M1 mixtape <laughs> tour, he caught a little seam pattern and took it to the house. He juked out like three guys. Max Duggan was throwing it around the yard. Kendra Miller was running on him. And Di Mercado, Amani Bailey. Sam Jackson got some reps at the end of the game because it was out of reach. Like, because he just needed some some work and they wanted to keep Max healthy. So first off, just what were your thoughts about how (laughs) awesome and funny everything was on Saturday afternoon? Yeah, it was unexpected. No, I was on the same wavelength. I was very much, if they can have this be a respectable one possession loss, which they hadn't done. That's the thing is they had lost eight straight. Mm-hmm. And other than 2015, when Baker Mayfield left the game with a concussion, and Bram Kohlhausen was actually was actually uh, playing most of that game for TCU, and 2019, where Jalen Hurts had like a couple backbreaking turnovers in the red zone that made the game closer than it sh- uh, than it probably should have been, including like a pick six to Vernon mm-hmm. Scott that single handedly got Vernon Scott drafted. Um, other than those two games, like none of them have been competitive. They get like they got vaporized, like just run out of the gym every year. And so I was very much ag- in agreement with you. If they just like were competitive, it was it was a it was a good fight. Then I was going to be inc- like just totally satisfied. And I think what we saw was this game, or at least with the coaches that are here with these two schools now relative to the previous matchup it's a total inversion you know i've tweeted about this uh i tweeted about this last week i tweeted about it a few times lincoln riley just like had gary patterson's number like just like nobody was able to just like pick apart gary's defenses as consistently as lincoln did um we can go we could spend a long time talking about why that was um with venables and sunny dykes at least after round one not the case. Um, I agree with you. I, I think there's been a lot of revisionist history <laughs> about, oh, Lincoln Riley actually wasn't a good coach. The guy who <laughs> won four straight Big 12 titles, got to the playoff three times mm-hmm. in, in five years. Like, okay, okay sure. sure. Yeah. Um, I understand it was a bad breakup and you're totally allowed to be upset about it. That's fine. But like Lincoln Riley's in a top five coach in college football and don't act like he's not. Um, and Venables may very, may very well may turn out well, but like <laughs> Garrett Riley and Sonny Dykes were doing whatever they wanted on offense. And to your point, like they, they way let up in the second half. Like this could have easily been a 65 or 70 point game from the TCU offense, which is insane to think about. And it was just like really fun to watch um, them play with that level of um, joy and explosiveness and swagger. It was really, really cool to see. And honestly, like, you know, this Oklahoma defense, Oklahoma as a whole, not a very good team this year, at least as of, as it stands right now, their defense is atrocious. So you take everything with a little bit of a grain of salt, but guess what? Good teams, when they play teams that are undisciplined or that make mistakes, you take advantage of them. 
And yeah. they did exactly what they were supposed to do. Oklahoma kept handing them opportunities and they said, yes, please, I will take advantage of these opportunities and run with it. And so that was gratifying to see TCU like uh, convert um, those many, many opportunities mm-hmm. they got, which is something they haven't done in a long time. Right. And I mean, football, especially college football is a week to week game. Like it's a lot about matchups and you never know what you're going to get, but it's hard not to get carried away with expectations after what happened. They're four. No, now they pulled off an unexpected win. So uh, not to get into like win total and all that, but I just want to know, this is the best you felt about TCU football in the present and then moving forward since when, when is the last time you felt this good about, about where the program was going? Oh, you know, it was probably, this is going to, this is going to kind of be a weird answer. And I'm really hopeful that this is, this answer is not predictive (laughs) of what's going to happen next. The probably the Ohio state game in 2018 Mm. where okay, you lost that game. And that's the thing is, 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 it's different. If we're talking about after a win, probably uh, beating the, the bejesus out of Baylor in 2017, that's probably the actual answer. Um, but 2018 against Ohio State, you lose that game, but they're a top five team in the country and you went toe to toe with them for like 50 out of 60 minutes before it kind of got out of hand. They couldn't match up with your speed. And you're like, oh, okay, like we, we, we see the blueprint, right? Yeah. And then obviously things began to unravel like as early as the next week <laughs> against Texas. Yeah. But um, that was probably the last time, like just being able to believe in it's like, oh, look at the talent that this roster has. Look at how they're able to match up with a traditional power. And, and like you get in a big moment against a big time opponent and you deliver. Um, that was it, it, and it's, and that's, you know, four years ago. And so it's really cool to, you know, be at that moment. Now, what was it for you? Well, this afternoon, when I first thought about it, my first thought was during the 2020 year, because they did rip off five straight wins. But then the more I sat with it, I was like, well, they did, they won five straight games, but every week we were sort of like, they're winning games. That's kind of cool. but they're running the ball 75 times and we don't really know if Max Duggan is any good. And so it it didn't feel good about the future of the program. Um, Yeah. It was probably like in 2017 when they went on the road and beat Oklahoma state in Stillwater. Yeah. Yeah. That was like a, Oh, this team's actually good. Like they have a recipe to win um, and, and they can find a way to win big games on the road. So that's probably the best I've felt since then and i mean the the games keep coming because they're playing ku on saturday and college game day will be there in lawrence for undefeated ku versus undefeated tcu college game days on campus at the top 20 right man just like we all drew it up yep same week as red river same week as a&m alabama everybody's gonna be watching tcu in kansas and lawrence what a world um okay so specifically on the offense let's talk about a few players let's talk about max first I mean, we'll do it again. Like, he's just been incredible. Um, and you brought up a good point today that I didn't really consider during the game. But one thing that you've noticed is just pocket awareness, kind of moving around and making plays, moving around and not immediately taking off, you know, with his legs, but using that mobility to make plays down the field. So what have you seen from Max in that capacity lately? Yeah. I mean, it's night and day even since last week. We talked about this last week when we were talking about the offensive line issues and him taking five sacks against SMU. They come back this week, and on the 73-yarder to, to, to Tay Barber, he keeps his eyes down. They, they, it's, a, it's a three-man rush, but one man gets through. He shuffles to his left, keeps his mm-hmm. eyes downfield as he does it to avoid the pressure, and then makes the throw as another guy is coming and making a hit on him. And – maintains composure doesn't panic mm-hmm. doesn't scramble doesn't take a sack either but delivers a t- uh, throw on target now was it you know tay barber had to basically come to a complete stop to make the, but is he, <laughs> Still, he saw yeah. the man he made it right and um another instance the, the honestly the instance of pocket awareness that was um uh that impressed me the most on saturday was they uh they got um they, they had a free runner at him 
he's trying to get out of the pocket, rolling out to his right, and he doesn't have anywhere to go with it. And, and like, as the defender, I forget which Oklahoma defender it was, starts wrapping up his ankles, he gets the ball away and gets it out of bounds and avoids the sack and just throws it away, which, like, we were talking about last week, like, just feeling that pressure and being mm-hmm. able to, like, that's that's a step forward for him, for a guy who has – not done a good job of like knowing where the defenders and the pass rushers are in space and not done a good job of protecting the ball and, and and not doing a good job of um, avoiding those negative plays. He did that multiple times. Great. And um, in addition to all the stuff that we've already talked about, which is that, you know, he's making good decisions. He's not really having a bunch of turnover worthy plays. His ball placements better. Um, You know, he's just being really efficient. And so, um, it's all coming together for him right now. Garrett Riley's putting him in positions to succeed, which is, which is great. Um, He had a few errant passes early, but he settled down. He didn't Mm -hmm. get rattled by it. Um, Previous iterations of Max Duggan would have like really been hot and cold all day. And he'd like, he settled in and found his rhythm and tore him up. Yeah, he did. Um, He's just been, he's been amazing. I really can't like, I can't say enough about the improvement and it's, it's strange how we've come to this point because he wasn't the starter to start the season, but we're here now and he's, he's excelling um, back to the wide receivers for a minute. So saving on Williams, uh, he only had three catches for 31 yards, but he had a touchdown on Saturday and it was a contested catch. Um, he also had a nice catch in traffic where Max kind of threw a bullet and he came back to the ball and snagged one. So two full question here. One is, is Savion, like we, we went into the season saying Quentin Johnson was kind of the guy on the outside. That was going to be the big body, catch all the 50-50 balls, make plays. Is Savion sort of coming into that role? And then secondly, I mean, this isn't a criticism. It's just an observation, Matt. They're spreading the ball around like crazy. And you look at the box score each week, like Tay Barber, you mentioned him, and you're like, oh, yeah, Tay had a great game yesterday. He had three catches for 107 yards, which is, I mean, that's an impressive stat line, but it's three receptions. You know, Quentin Johnson had four, Gunnar Henderson had one, Darius Davis had seven for 32, but they kind of use him in that way, a lot of quick stuff. Um, but they don't really seem to care or have any idea of having a number one wide receiver, which I guess if you're scoring 55 points, who cares? Yeah, if they are – if they're carving out anything specific for any particular players, it more has to do with roles than like, Oh, this one guy, we really want to get him the ball. Right. Yeah. And so Savion touchdowns in back-to-back weeks. And it looks like he might be emerging as like a, as like a real red zone threat. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Where, you know, he's got the big body, he's got the ball control. He can go up and make contested catches. I admit as well to having kind of the, is, is Savion kind of what they, you know, may I don't think it's going to happen this year, but like I think a ceiling for him would for would be for him to become a number one guy, yeah. um, like what they you know, like what what Quentin Johnson um, has been at times, you know. And so, you know, but he's been great in that role. Tay Barber making you know doing what he's done forever, which is like, oh, let me go make clutch ca- uh, catches over the middle on third down, right? Like that's just mm-hmm. his his mo, right? Uh, Darius Davis on the smoke screens and um, you know those quick sh- uh, shovel passes and everything like that. Um, so they're you know they're, but they're giving it to everybody and they're saying, hey, everybody's gonna have a role. We're gonna use you in the way that makes the most sense for, given your skill set, and it's working. And I'll say this for for QJ. He was quiet, relatively quiet again, still no touchdown, but you know, OU was kind of just like mugging him on every play yeah. and like, Hey, there's worse things than to uh, attract so much attention that like every time the ball gets your thrown way, thrown your way, essentially it's a pass interference penalty and it's mm-hmm. a few 15 yards. Right. So um, that's honestly probably smart on Oklahoma's part. Cause they, I mean, it became very clear, very quickly. They did not have uh, uh, the horses in the back end of their defense to match up with uh, Johnston or anybody sure, uh, yeah. on the, from the TCU receiving course. So yeah, you know, I think Riley, I think Garrett Riley on, on the whole was, is doing a really phenomenal job of scheming guys open, getting them the ball in ways that utilize their skill sets. Well, um, yeah, they're it's it's super fun, right? Because you because mm-hmm. for the last two three years it's been like we're gonna throw 
uh, we're going to throw a jump ball to Quentin Johnson down the sideline. We're going to throw a contested, we're going to ask, you know, Tay Barber to go make a, a, a contested back shoulder catch in traffic on third down. Like that, yeah. that's been the passing offense largely. And so it's nice to see them um, scheme guys open and, and utilize their skill sets in ways that just make sense. Novel concepts. <laughs> That reminded me, just talking about the pass interference calls, uh, that reminded me a few years ago when they got destroyed in Morgantown, which I'm sorry, I don't remember which year because that unfortunately has happened way too frequently lately, but the offense was struggling and they weren't scoring at all. and They were backed up at like their own goal line and they decided let's throw a go route to Quentin. And so Max threw one up and the DB just mugged Quentin and tackled them and the ref threw a flag and like, Brian Estridge was so starved for a positive offensive play that when he saw the flag, he just started screaming, <laughs> there's a flag for pass interference because that's how bad the offense had been oh, that day God. was that, you know, the, that PI was at least something to get them out of the shadow of their own goal line and, and move forward a little bit. Uh, staying on the offense, one, one more topic here. So you, you talked about the offensive line last week and we kind of disagreed on where they were. Um, and you're right, Matt, at least on Saturday, like one, they ran the ball for 361 yards on the ground, um, only gave up one sack in the fourth quarter. Just really impressive. Again, OU's defense is bad. I mean, that's just kind of unequivocally true, but still uh, they looked much improved and the communication seemed a lot better between this week and in that SMU game a couple of weeks ago now. Yeah, they obviously they, they were run blocking incredibly well again to your point grain of salt Oklahoma's defense at every level is is bad um but in terms of the things that were really interesting to me a like Kendra Miller and Amari De Mercado like becoming a dude like as a super senior which is kind of fun to watch um but uh uh, uh Kendra averaged 10 and a half yards a carry De Mercado averaged 7.8 um just absurd and they're also like doing a few different things where you know the mo for so long under Cumbia Meacham was it was like inside zone outside zone very which is fine like you can run zone blocking scheme and have a whole lot of success but they're using some like some some gap blocking schemes and some um and some like pulling guard and tackle concepts which is like just is really just like jarring to see TCU uh, do offensively including on Kendra Miller's first touchdown you know Robert Griffin III on the broadcast like highlighted Brandon Coleman coming around and laying the the seal that that sprung him on that on his first touchdown run and I'm like who are these people who are doing this and who and Garrett Riley where did you come from what are you doing here I mean that actually is like part of what made Oklahoma so devastating under Lincoln was the fact that they use like the air raid passing concepts in combination with like counter and, and, you know, a lot of pulling guard, pulling tackle stuff. And um, which is just like, those things don't always normally go together. And so all that to say, they are doing some different stuff. They're being uh, than they just always do, which probably makes things a little bit harder on opposing defenses. They don't, you know, it's not, they're not as predictable. And they're being effective with it and they're developing and, you know, and, and we're just talking about run blocking pass protection. They gave up one sack. They gave up five to SMU. They gave up one to Oklahoma. And, and I think, like we said last week, it's a team effort, right? The, I think that the offensive line and the tackles in particular did a better job in pass protection and Max Duggan did a better job feeling that pressure. And I mean, you're doing, you do a better job at um, analyzing offensive line play than I do. But to me, it seemed like they, um, they absolutely were holding their own better, knew their assignments better and working together better as a unit than I had seen them, not just last week, but really at any point this season. Yeah, I didn't pay a ton of attention to how much movement there was, you know, on the OU defensive line as far as stunts and twists and that kind of thing. Uh, Venables is typically very complex in, in that sort of scheme. I know they're really early, but um, I mean, honestly, it was just a clean pocket all day. So they're communicating well, they're passing guys off the right way. And, and that's all you you want from from your O-line when you're discussing, you know, those kind of those kind of situations and concepts. One more thing. I know we just just to talk about OU for just a second. Defensive, like 
if I were an OU fan, I'd be a little worried. <laughs> we They've been doing this, like, to your point, like, oh, under Venables, it's going to be more physical. They're going to be a better defensive team. They're going to be able to match up with, like, the SEC teams that they would face in the playoffs, yada, yada. The problems that and, and what one of the narratives has been like, oh, roster turnover and Lincoln Riley, like the defense this year, it's going to be a growing pains because he's playing with Lincoln Riley's guys. OK, fine. The problems with Oklahoma's defense on Saturday were not like we don't have the talent. We don't have the horses. The problems on the defense, a lot of them were guys blown coverages bad reads, horrible angles to the ball in so many instances, including Gunnar Henderson's touchdown, including uh, Max Duggan's uh, first rushing touchdown, like guys just like playing with poor leverage and like, okay, you can't coach speed, you can't coach strength, but like if you're the defensive guru, you're the guy your team should be playing fundamentally sound defense if nothing else. Right. And so like, that's the thing that would worry me. And it makes me think of like how the narrative today on like Tony Elliott, who's still the offensive coordinator at Clemson is very different now that he's been without like a Trevor Lawrence or a Deshaun Watson for a few years. And somebody was like, Oh, he doesn't have a generational talent at, at QB. And suddenly things don't look great. And I, and I am curious, it's, we're super early. We're like four games in, but I'm very curious to see how things pan out with Venables. Now that maybe he's going to get these guys in eventually, but he doesn't have like the elite defensive linemen that he had at Clemson year in and year out. And he doesn't have like elite playmakers in the back end, like in the back end, like Isaiah Simmons and uh, mm-hmm. AJ Terrell and like, pick any Clemson defensive back from the last eight years. Right. And so those are the things that are like, if I'm an Oklahoma fan, I'm like, huh, that's concerning. Yeah. The chunk plays on Saturday were crazy. I mean, the 67 yard touchdown run, 73 yard touchdown pass, 62 yard touchdown pass, 69 yard touchdown run. You know, that's blown assignments. That's just fundamentally not understanding what you're supposed to do. And it happened four or five times, which is unacceptable. Um, quickly on the TCU defense, it's, it's hard for me to talk about it fully because I just feel like it was such a weird game once Gabriel went out. Um, now, in fairness, they were up 34 to 10, and Dylan Gabriel did not look impressive. But I guess just overall, your thoughts on the defensive performance and how they hung in there and, and slowed down no you attack that we know, I mean, has been explosive to the, this year to this point, even with some of Gabriel's inconsistencies. Yeah, I don't think you – I think everything after Gabriel went out of the game is gravy. You're, you're happy that the defense continued to execute, but you, you throw it out. You don't use it to evaluate anything because like they couldn't throw the ball with, with Bevel in there and and that's, and that's fine. So you just, you leave it. But to your point, Gabriel wasn't looking good in the beginning, but it wasn't really because TC was like, pressuring him a ton they, they they were doing a better job of getting pressure than they were probably against smu but gabriel was just missing open guys so i still have a little bit of concern about the tcu secondary like they're still there were a bunch of guys who were open <laughs> for oklahoma um gabriel just wasn't hitting them i think if he had stayed in the game um been able to stay in the game and stay healthy um he probably would have settled in at some point but i think i i, I agree i think the game was in hand i don't think if he stays in for four quarters, I don't think it changes the outcome at all. I think it's just a closer margin. Um, uh, so I, I, the concerns that I have are still the same. And I think the secondary um, outside of Trey Hodges, Tomlinson and Miller Bradford, I have questions about, um, I think Abe Kamara, at least in, you know, yes, on Saturday, stepping up, you know, maybe proving me wrong this far. Love it. Keep doing it. Um, but still a little concerned about like their depth back there and their ability to match up with the receivers they're going to see in big 12 play. And, um, but beyond that, um, I think they did a little bit better job rushing the passer. They're doing a really good job stopping the run, which was their biggest weakness last year. And Dominic Williams is a, is a monster, just an absolute problem. And, uh, so, uh, it's just been very, very fun to see him and it's going to be fun to continue to see him grow. Um, you know, uh, and it's going to be really important for them to continue to stop the run because their opponent this week, uh, Kansas, um, they run some super wacky um, option run concepts. They're going to have to be disciplined and fundamentally sound, and they're going to be able to, they need to be able to control the line of scrimmage. 
Yeah, what a world. I mean, KU, Jalen Daniels, their QB, is having a great season. Um, They do run some really interesting and cool triple option concepts out of the gun. They're going to be hard to defend. So that's the game this week. Um, I mean, Matt, I guess just quickly here, what are some of your thoughts about this matchup and some of the keys for TCU to get to 5-0 and on the road? Yeah, I think y- you you need to – continue to be efficient on offense. I don't think you can expect to have multiple, you know, 60 plus yard touchdowns uh, every single week. Um, So what happens, they didn't have to worry so much about like the streakiness that we talked about last week um, because they just like kept having like three play touchdown drives. And so who cares? Um, So can you sustain drives, um, especially on the road in an environment that They've had two straight sellouts. I'm assuming they're gonna, for the first time in a long time. I'm assuming Kansas is going to sell out again, um, and especially with game day in town. So, like, how are you going to avoid those mistakes and those like negative plays and and um, miscommunications or procedural penalties in the previous few weeks that you didn't have on Saturday? Um, are you going to continue to avoid those and you know just move methodically down the field, which TCU did a couple times uh, against Oklahoma when they had. To- so keeping that up on offense on defense yeah just being disciplined and being fundamentally sound um the good news for them is you know we keep we keep talking about but gillespie's whole philosophy joe gillespie's whole philosophy is um it 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 is it is more of a bend don't break style they're gonna keep the kansas offense in front of them they're gonna make kansas drive the length of the field but then you have to finish right which they did against oklahoma uh, can't, uh, it's after, you know, SMU converted half of their third downs, all of their fourth downs, Oklahoma, it was, it was uh, a third of each. It was six of 18 on third down, one of three on fourth down. And, um, they, uh, and they held them, they held them out of scoring territory most of the game. And when they got in there, um, they weren't giving up a ton of touchdowns. And so can you finish drives, whether that's in the red zone or whether that's on third down, fourth down, whatever it is, can you keep doing that against a Kansas offense? That's a whole lot of fun. Um, I think the TCU offense against the Kansas defense is a, is a matchup that favors the frogs in a big way, but I think Kansas has the horses and the scheme on offense to make life like really just a pain for the TCU defense. And so I think it could be, it should be a really fun matchup and it's like, like, it's really cool to see these two teams both be in this position. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to be great. TCU and Kansas, undefeated teams facing off on Saturday. Uh, thanks for tuning in to Locked on Horn Trials. Subscribe on YouTube. Excuse me. Also, you can find us wherever your podcasts are. And we'll have plenty of coverage of that game all week long. Uh, it's your team every day.